Hello, and welcome to the 2018 Summer Webcast Series offered to you by the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Master Gardener Program. My name is Susan DeBleek, and I wanted to give you a quick introduction to our presentation today. We're really excited about all of the speakers that are presenting as part of this summer webcast series. The hope is that Master Gardener volunteers and community members who love to garden will broaden their skills. And this is the list of topics that we're offering this summer. Today's webinar is the second in the three-part series, and it's focused on learning about native bees and what you can do to help them. And also you're going to learn about how to grow vegetables organically. A couple materials we have for you today. We've got a worksheet so that you can take notes and also see our list of resources. And we also have there the link to the online evaluation. A reminder that if you are a Master Gardener volunteer, please log your continuing education hours. 10 continuing education hours are required each year to stay active in the Iowa Master Gardener program, and you can log those online on the volunteer reporting system. Our first presenter today is Randall Cass. Hello, hello Master Gardeners. My name is Randall Cass, and I'm an extension entomologist for Iowa State University. Um, I'm an extension entomologist that focuses on honeybees and native bees. My position is 70% extension, 30% research. So today I'm going to be talking about what the bee research we're doing here at Iowa State University means for everyday Iowans and hopefully provide you with some best practices that you can implement, whether, whether you're a beekeeper yourself, whether you're a gardener, or whether you have land that you want to make more pollinator friendly. So it's titled Bee Research and Best Practices. And let's get started. All right, let's talk about bees. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of questions for me about bees. The one I get the most is probably, the bees are sick, right? Is anything happening about that? What's, what's with the bees? Um, and hopefully I'll be able to address that in this talk. Uh, but first, let's talk about the definition of what a bee is. So in my work, we've come across uh, a study where they asked the general population, what is a bee? They wanted to get uh, a better idea of whether or not average folks are able to identify bees when they see them. They presented them with this picture. Um, as you can see, it's got a variety of different insects. And they asked folks to identify which ones were bees. Which ones were they sure they could identify as bees? So there's some obvious ones on here. Um, take a look. Uh, different numbered ones. Let's start with number three. Um, that one is clearly not a bee. Most people are able to recognize that that is not a bee. Um, when you think of what a bee looks like, maybe you think of, you know, Honey Nut Cheerios. Maybe maybe you think of uh, something big, yellow and black and fluffy. So an obvious one that would come to mind is this one up here, number two. Um, that one. That one. That one seems like a bee. That definitely could be a bee. Uh, but there's, as you look around, it can get a little more difficult. Are bees only fluffy and yellow and black? Uh, can bees be green? Uh, how hairy are they? Uh, and what is this one? <laughs> I always ask this one when I get presentations. You know, is, could this be a bee? Do all bees have wings? Um, and I get some interesting answers. When they were able to poll the people in the study and see what insects they were able to identify as bees, uh, these were the results. So, yeah, the, the second one I pointed out, the big fluffy yellow one, that's a, that's a bumblebee. Uh, pretty much everyone was able to identify that as a bee. Also, the one next to it uh, in this graph, that, that's a honeybee. Um, and most people were able to identify that one as well. Um, then, then the waters got a little bit murkier. You know, around 60 to 80 percent were able to identify some of the some of the native bees or wild bees. Uh, a lot of people identified that that weird one without wings as a bee incorrectly. Almost half the people did. Um, just so you know that 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 one um, is it looks like an ant 
Uh, it doesn't have wings. It's orange. Uh, it's referred to as a velvet ant, but it is actually a type of wasp, a female wasp that has a pretty nasty sting. Anyway, I bring up this study because I like to get people talking about what makes a bee a bee and talk to people about how there are other bees out there than the bees that are just making honey for us, other bees that are also pollinating our crops. They say that uh, every third bite of food we eat uh, is the result of pollination with bees. You can think of some major crops that bees pollinate, whether it's berries or citrus. Almonds uh, are, are one of the crops that requires um, bees, pollinators, 100% in order to be produced. Uh, and then there's also things, for example, my father was a, was a seed producer for canola seed for canola oil. And they actually uh, paid beekeepers to bring their bees in to, uh, for, for pollination services when they were hybridizing different varieties um, and they needed full pollination for that service. So these are some of the important roles that all the different types of bees, whether they're honeybees, bumblebees, or other native bees, that they all play. Um, and they're important to us, which is why some of these statistics that have been coming out in the past decade are a little bit concerning. So here I have a photo depicting honeybee losses that have been reported by state in the United States. This, this information is a little bit old, but I think it's still pretty accurate for today. So for the 2014-2015 season, and uh, we're talking specifically about honeybees here, um, beekeepers reported really high losses, in st especially here in the Midwest. So if you can look and see uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Iowa, all of those beekeepers reported 60% or higher colony loss. Um, there's a lot of things that can contribute to this, which I'll be talking about a little bit later, different stressors that affect our honeybees. But you can see what's important, um, what is an important takeaway from this slide is that Iowa, right there in the center of the country, uh, for, for the state, we experience pretty heavy colony losses every year. So this is something that's important, not only for our beekeepers that are producing honey, but also for, for different folks that require um, pollinators. When we look at not just honeybees, but we look at native bees, this map shows us native bee abundance. So when we talk about abundance, we're talking about the, their populations and the different numbers of species that we have. So blue areas on this map show where there's high bee abundance, a lot of different types of native bees. Now in the United States, we have thousands of, native, of bee species. Um, most of them are not honey producing like, our honey, like their honey bee cousins. Um, in Iowa alone, we've been able, uh, at Iowa State University, in our research in the past few years, we've been able to identify um, nearly 300 or 400 different species in the soybean fields and the prairies where we're conducting research. So we know that there's quite a few different species here in Iowa, but you can see that uh, comparatively, if we look at Iowa itself, um, it's got comparatively lower abundance of native species of bee um, compared to other states like Nevada or even uh, the western part of Texas, Arizona. Um, it's a pretty yellow part on the map. So that is why uh, research about native bee populations and about honeybee health is very relevant to Iowa. Here we have a map that shows how Iowa compares to neighboring states in terms of uh, what percent of its landscape is don dominated by annual crop production. So here in Iowa, I mean, <laughs> those of us who live here know it's a corn state, it's a soybean state, and that's mostly it. 12.3 uh, million hectares of land are in our cropland for farms. About almost 85% of the land itself is, uh, is cropland, uh, which is interesting considering that um, prior to agricultural production moving in, uh, most of Iowa's landscape was prairie, um, and today the percentage of Iowa landscape that is devoted to prairie is one-tenth of one percent. So we can see how much we've changed the landscape of Iowa um, over the past hundred years. Um, and 
as the slide mentions, 9.4 million hectares in Iowa are devoted to corn and soybean production. Looking at the map, I find this very interesting uh, because you can really get an idea of, of what, uh, what a big agricultural state Iowa is. Um, we, know that, uh, we know that we've got other agricultural producers in Wisconsin or Michigan, but if you, just in sheer number of, of hectares in this map, that are devoted to agricultural production, I think it's, I think it's pretty striking. Part of our research at Iowa State University has been devoted to looking at the number of different species of bees that we're finding in, in the Iowa agricultural systems. So a few years ago, uh, so a few years ago, native bees were collected from different soybean sites where we were conducting our research. Uh, those native bees, of those native bees, we were able to identify 42 different species in the 10 fields where we were looking. And overall, in the past few years, Iowa State University has uh, been able to identify nearly 200 species of bee. As I mentioned before, unlike the honeybees, most of these bees are solitary bees. They build their nests in logs, or in the ground, um, and they lay their eggs in these burrows or tunnels, and most are not honey producing. I like to talk a lot about native bees because, as I mentioned before, I feel like they're sort of forgotten about. A lot of people, for example, I was giving a, a talk a few weeks ago, and a woman said, what do you mean you talk about honeybees and native bees? Aren't honeybees native? And the truth is no, uh, honeybees aren't native to North America. Uh, settlers brought them over from Europe. So they're a European variety of honeybee. As I mentioned before, most native bees are solitary and build their nests in, in burrows or tunnels, in wood or in mud. And one of the issues that we're looking at as we conduct our research is whether or not these honeybees brought in from Europe negatively impact the abundance or the population size of native species in the United States. However, so far in our research, uh, we haven't seen any negative impacts, at least not with the number of hives that we are le leaving in different landscapes. So many of our research projects will place 8 to 16 hives in one spot, whether it's a, a prairie landscape or a soybean landscape, and we're not seeing that negatively affect the populations of native species. Now. I showed a picture with a bunch of different insects on it before and asked you to identify a bee. Looking at this photo right here on this slide, can you tell me is that a bee or not? A lot of people think it is, but it's not. It's actually a fly. It's a hoverfly or a surfeit fly. I took that picture in Polk County a few months ago. So talking about getting more specific about our research, it's funded by USDA and NEFA, and as I mentioned, we're looking at soybean systems and prairie systems, since soybean makes up a lot of the, the annual crop acreage in Iowa. It's a big part of the economy, so it makes sense that when we're studying Iowa landscapes and honeybee health, that we would look into soybean. And we're also looking at prairie systems, as I, um, we're also looking at prairie systems, since prairie was such an important part of the Iowa landscape prior to agricultural production and because there are still many remnant prairies um, that provide a lot of floral resources and that a lot of native species of bee call home. The study also seeks to look at how the Iowa landscapes affect honeybee and native bee health, and we're looking at three primary stressors. We're looking at we're looking at three primary stressors, and we call these the three P's. The first P being pests and disease, the second P being poor forage, and the third P being pesticide exposure. For the first P, when we talk about pests and disease, we're talking about different viruses that honeybees can contract, viruses that they can also share with their cousins, such as bumblebees or sweat bees. We're trying to look at how the parasite, the varroa mite, which has in the past decade become the biggest health stressor for bees. The varroa mite is a parasite that lives on the back of the honeybees and it sucks on their fat. And 
as it sucks their fat, it can also transfer viruses between the bees. So this can significantly contribute to the weakening of a honeybee hive. And it may also hinder the health of native bees if, if the viruses are being transferred between the different species. The second P, poor forage, uh, we're looking at the availability of flowers that provide nectar and pollen resources for honeybees and native bees. So you can imagine uh, in a landscape that's mostly corn and soy, there's not a lot of floral diversity. And depending on the time of year, there may not be a lot of floral availability for the bees. So in our, our experiment is designed to look at floral resources and how that affects the hive health and the population of native species. The third P we're looking at, pesticide exposure, we're incorporating into our research to see how, depending on how a farmer treats their field with insecticides, we're looking at how that negatively impacts honeybees and the abundance of native bees. When I talk about honeybee and native bee health, we're measuring these in a few different ways. Some of the indicators include hive mass, so the weight of the hives, that the weight of the hive will tell us how much nectar they're collecting, how much honey they're storing up, but also how big their population is. Generally, the heavier the hive, the healthier the hive. We're also looking at populations within hives, and for native bees, we're collecting uh, samples in pop of populations in our different research sites. We're looking at queen fecundity, which is a fancy way of saying how many eggs the queen is laying. And then, as I mentioned before, we're looking at viruses and virus transfer between species. We got a big team helping us out with this USDA NEFA grant. Um, Dr. Amy Toth, Dr. Adam Dolezal, Dr. Matt O'Neill, and Dr. Aaron Hodgson are all lending their expertise to the project. We're lucky to have a postdoctoral researcher, Harman Hendrixma, uh, who's here all the way from the Netherlands, lending us his bee nutrition expert expertise. Um, and we have two graduate students working with us, Ashley St. Clair and, and Ga Jang. My role for this project is to act as the extension arm. Uh, as part of the conditions of the USDA NEFA grant, one third of the funding for this research is devoted to extension. So that's where I come in, um, talking to folks that can actually use this research and implement some of the best practices we're recommending in order to conserve pollinator populations. But I'm also using my role to conduct surveys to get better ideas about how Iowans feel about pollinators, um, what practices they're willing to implement, what practices they're interested in learning more about, and what type of role they're interested in taking on in terms of working towards pollinator conservation that would create better landscape for honeybees and native bees. This research started as the result of some preliminary uh, experiments that were conducted by Dr. Adam Dolezal. He looked across the Iowa landscape and he saw a lot of corn and soy and he thought, you know, that probably can't be the best resource for nectar and pollen for bees. But we don't have any scientific evidence backing that up. So what they decided to do was place 10 hives in an area of high cultivation. So they placed 10 hives in parts of the state where 80% of a mile radius around the hive site was devoted to corn and soybean production. So they placed 10 hives in areas that were 80% corn and soy, and then they placed eight hives in landscapes that they saw as more diverse. Landscapes that included within a mile radius riparian areas or forests or even urban areas with a lot of gardens in them. The idea was that they would compare the two different styles of Iowa landscapes, high cultivation, mostly corn and soy, and low cultivation, mostly natural areas or urban areas, and they would see how that affected honeybee health. And the results were somewhat surprising. On this graph, you can see they were measuring hive mass. Like I said, hive mass tells us about the honeybee health because it tells us um, how fat the bees are, how much nectar they're collecting, how much honey they're storing. The heavier the hive, the healthier the hive. On this graph, you can see the green line was the, the mass of the hives that were left in corn and soybean. 
the corn, the hives that were left in corn and soybean fields put on more weight than the hives that were in more diverse landscapes, which kind of came as a surprise. But it signaled to us one thing, and that was that probably the soybean, the flowering soybean, provided a really great nectar, nectar resource for the honeybees, especially during the summertime. And one thing you can also see on this graph, which was which guided our, our next steps with the research, is that around the period of mid-August is when both the, the complex landscapes and the simple landscapes, um, the hives that were placed in those different landscapes, no matter where they were placed, their mass starts falling. So what does that mean in Iowa? What happens in mid-August? Uh, well, the soybeans are, are done flowering. Um, they're starting to put on pods. So there's less floral resources overall for the bees, and they start eating the honey and the nectar that they've stored up. So that's what happens uh, in mid-August, no matter where the bees are placed in Iowa. And that's worrisome because you can see that by October, um, on the graph, they have significantly less honey. And in Iowa, where we have such cold winters, uh, honey storage is important for the bees going into winter so that they're able to survive the, the freezing temperatures of Iowa. So the team thought about ways to, to ameliorate this problem. This graph shows what happens when we leave hives in a soybean field for the summer, but halfway through that summer in that mid-August period, we take half of those hives and put them in a prairie landscape site. We decided to move them to a prairie landscape site because uh, the team was thinking, what's an area that would still have floral resources uh, in late August, September, October? What, what's an area that would have resources for honeybees to feed on and get their hives nice and heavy with honey going into the winter? So on this graph, you can look at hive mass once again. The black line shows the hives that were left in soybean fields after that mid-August period. And the green dotted line shows the hives that were moved to a prairie site. So this graph is great in demonstrating how hives are able to rescue when they are placed at sites with, um, higher, with a higher amount of floral resources for the bees. Moving forward for the USDA NEFA experiment, we're hoping to uh, repeat these results, but also not only take into account uh, forage availability, um, poor forage being the second major P, the second major stressor for bees. We also want to take into account pests and disease and pesticide exposure. So for, the, so for our research that we are currently conducting, we have three different soybean sites that we are leaving hives in. The three different sites are treated differently with insecticides. So the first type of site is uh, soybeans that are treated conventionally. That is, soybeans that are, that are sprayed prophylactically at specific dates throughout the year. This is to mimic um, the, the practices of farmers that want to ensure that they don't have any pest pressure throughout the year. Instead of monitoring for pests, they just spray prophylactically uh, to make sure that no pests are affecting the yield of their crops at all. So that's the first type of treatment. The second type of treatment we call integrated pest management. So in these soybeans, we'll be sending graduate students out to scout for pests and to uh, estimate the pest population. And in these fields, we will only spray once the pest population reach, reaches a specific threshold that we know that their damage will um, hurt our yield later in the season. So once that threshold has been calculated and the pest population reaches that number, that's when we will spray those fields with insecticides. And those are the integrated pest management fields. And finally, the third type of soybean field we'll have is no spray, where regardless of the pest pressure, we're not spraying any insecticide at all. So in all three of these different treatments of soybean, come that mid-August period, we're going to be moving half of those hives into prairie landscapes. Um, most of the, our fields and the prairie landscapes we've been able to find are in and around the Ames area, in Boone County, in Polk County. Um, and 
the idea for us is to see if we're able to mimic these results. We carried this out last summer, and the results that we were able to find were pretty similar to the prior research. So once again, we're looking at hive mass, or the weight of the hive. The, the hive masses tend to look pretty similar throughout the year. However, uh, in mid-August, we moved half the hives to prairie, and come October, you can see that the, the orange line, the hives that were moved to prairie, uh, we're able to continue increasing in mass, whereas the green line, which is the hives that were kept in soybean, uh, continued to lose mass. So, so far our results are, are being repeated. As we go on over the next two years carrying out this research, we are looking at also at analyzing bee fat, because fat bees are happy bees. So for the honeybees and the native bees that we're collecting, we're going to be looking at how fat and happy they are, and have that be an indicator of health. We're going to continue observing the impact on native bee abundance and native bee populations in the soybean fields and the prairie systems to ensure that placing honeybee hives in these different landscapes isn't having a negative impact on the native species. Uh, this is to ensure that the honeybees aren't um, stealing resources away from the native species or that the honeybees aren't transmitting deadly viruses that could decimate native species populations. Uh, and we'll be continuing this experiment over the next two years. So that's all the information that's coming out of the ivory tower. What does this mean for regular folks? As part of my job, we've identified three major stakeholders for, for us to talk to about our research, and those are beekeepers, farmers, and landowners. And landowners includes also includes folks that just have a backyard garden and are looking to add, bring more pollinators to their yard. So first I'll talk about what this means for beekeepers. The recommendations that we're offering them have to do with um, making sure that their hives get monitored regularly for pests and disease. Back when I started working with bees um, over a decade ago, the beekeeper that uh, mentored me used to joke that Having bees was, was really simple. It was sort of like being in the National Guard. You only had to do it uh, one week in a month, two weeks out of every year. These days, it's not quite the same story. Beekeeping has become a lot more difficult as a result of the introduction of the Varroa mite into the United States um, and the proliferation of the Varroa mite across the country. Uh, and the Varroa mite is a parasite that is sucking the life out of our bees and spreading different viruses. So it's something that beekeepers need to be aware of and they need to be checking for constantly. We suggest that they check on their hives. They do hive inspections every week, every other week, and consider treatment options as soon as they see a mite because once there's one mite, they can reproduce really quickly. We're also asking beekeepers to take forage availability into consideration. So if a beekeeper is only leaving their hives in cropland areas, consider moving their hives late in the season, or consider relocating their hives to an area that provides better forage throughout the year. The ideal, I jokingly say the ideal landscape would be, you know, in a, on a roadside where you've got a prairie on one side of the road and a soybean field on the other, because the soybean will provide nectar throughout the summer, but the prairie will help stabilize the availability of pollen and different nectar resources. And finally, figure out ways to communicate with nearby farmers. So if you place your hives on your land, talk to your neighboring farmers. Talk to them about where you're placing them. Try to get in touch and let them know that you're interested in knowing uh, their spraying schedule or being alerted uh, when they're planning on spraying so that the two of you can make a decision for how to move forward without negatively affecting your hives. And I'll talk about a few different resources for doing that. Best practices for farmers. Uh, managing pesticide drift is important. For the most part, this involves following the label of the insecticide. So if the insecticide uh, mentions specific wind speeds, then it needs to be sprayed under um, different um, boom heights, different droplet sizes. Those, uh, those indications on the label need to be followed. Those indications on the label need to be followed. Many insecticides also now include a bee label. Uh, so this calls attention to insecticides th that are specifically bad for honeybees and pollinators. It's got a little picture of a bee on it. 
So those instructions need to be followed closely under federal law. The same is true for off-dusting with treated seed. Uh, most, most corn and soybeans in the United States are currently uh, treated. They're, they're coated with different insecticides or fungicides uh, when the seeds are planted. Now, during the planting process, this can kick a whole bunch of dust up into the air, and that can blow onto neighboring crops or blow into areas where pollinators are flying. Uh, this is called off-dusting. So off-dusting needs to be managed, uh, taking wind speed into consideration while planting, uh, taking into account the types of lubricants that farmers are using. Uh, many of them use talc, which can just create more dust and more of a problem for pollinators. So those are other considerations. Uh, and finally, after using their equipment, cleaning it out um, at a decent distance from different pollinator habitats. For farmers, we're also talking to them about establishing uh, pollinator habitat, enrolling in CRP programs if they're interested in taking land out of production, and I'll touch on that a little bit more later uh, in this presentation. And finally, utilizing an integrated pest management plan, or IPM plan, recognizing that it might be cheaper for them to calculate a population threshold uh, than to invest in more insecticides after seeing one pest. When it comes to spraying insecticides, Iowa is unique in that it has the B rule. So state law says that if a farmer has a flowering crop, pesticide applicators are not allowed to spray during the day if there is a registered beehive within a mile of that field. So what that means is that pesticide applicators have to check the hive registry or apiary registry before they are able to spray a field. If there is a hive within a mile of that field and that field is flowering, that pesticide applicator needs to get in touch with the beekeeper uh, in order to either make an arrangement uh, for the beekeeper to move their hives or close off the entrances that day, or the applicator can choose to spray at night at a time when the honeybees aren't foraging. This is made easier in uh, January of 2018. IDOLS uh, instituted a new way for, for beekeepers to register their hives and also for folks with specialty crops, whether that's organic crops, whether that's uh, grapes for wineries and vineyards, uh, which aren't very common uh, around these parts. Uh, what they can do is go online to the FieldWatch website and place a pin on a map. And you can see in this photo, all the pins that have been placed are different apiaries that are registered, and that that red circle that's created around each pen is the mile radius. So a pesticide applicator can log into the field watch website, put in the coordinates of the field he's, he or she are intending to spray, um, and then if there is overlap between the field and the one mile radius of an apiary, they can get in touch with that beekeeper easily. Uh, it's a relatively new system, uh, and from the folks I've talked to in IDOLS, so far it's been going pretty well. I know that I recently registered our apiaries here at Iowa State University on the website, and it was, it was real easy. Finally, for landowners, our third stakeholder, uh, we're talking to them about establishing more habitat that's pollinator friendly. We talked to them about establishing prairie. Um, prairie should include not just grasses, but also a lot of flowering forbs. Those will provide a good nectar resource. Uh, and I'll get into some of the good flowers that folks can plant. While I am not the expert on establishing prairies, there are several resources, including Pheasants Forever, a nonprofit organization that works to improve wildlife habitat across the state, and the Iowa DNR. They have a prairie resource center. Some of the different resources for folks that have uh, a decent amount of acreage that they're looking to take out of production or that they're looking to establish a prairie landscape on um, include the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP. With this program, landowners and farmers can take land out of production and plant more environmentally friendly or wildlife friendly landscapes. So this can include filter strips, riparian buffers, uh, pollinator habitat, 
riparian areas. Um, the contracts are usually 10 to 15 years. Unfortunately, as of now, a lot of the CRP funding is already all tied up. Um, they've already met their quota of folks uh, enrolled in the program. But over the next year, we're hoping to see um, more uh, spaces become available in that program. EQUIP is a similar program. It is, uh, it is assistance from the USDA, financial assistance from the USDA uh, to implement different environmentally friendly practices uh, on your land. And by environmentally friendly practices, I mean everything from planting trees and shrubs to planting cover crops to planting prairie landscapes. And folks can receive funding um, for a different number of years depending on the type of practice they're planning on implementing. So five years for native grass and wild plant, wildflower plantings, 10 years for planting trees uh, or a timber stand, and 15 years for trees and shrubs. Finally, uh, another program is the Prairie Partners Program that's put on by the Iowa DNR and Pheasants Forever. Uh, and they offer a cost share for folks that are interested in planting prairie landscapes or native grasses and wildflower plantings. Um, the minimum acreage size is two acres and they'll uh, assist with the maintenance of these areas for up to 10 years. One of the main takeaways that we have from our research is trying to increase communication between folks that have land, folks that have land with prairie systems or with a lot of flowering forbs and and beekeepers. So we're trying to give beekeepers more access to areas that aren't just corn and soybean, but areas that will provide better floral resources throughout the year. Uh, we joke about creating classified ads or a dating app where people can swipe left or right on prairies that look good for their bees. But at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to get the word out there that folks that have this area that have uh, wonderful floral resources um, that are great for the native species can also invite local beekeepers to leave their hives on their land as well. One way to do that is to reach out to different local beekeeping associations. Iowa has many of them across the state. Information and contact information for the different beekeeping associations can be found on the Iowa Honey Producers Association website. So if you look online, you can Google IHPA or the Iowa Honey Producers Association and find out more information on how to get in contact with local beekeeping groups if you're interested in inviting folks to leave bees on your land. So as I mentioned before, we are promoting planting flowering forbs, uh, whether that's in a prairie system or whether you just have a, a backyard where you want to see more beneficial insects. So on this slide, I have a table that we borrowed from Michigan State University that has a list of pl flowering plants that flower throughout the year. Uh, you want a good mixture of, of plants that flower in the early spring, throughout the sum uh, other plants that flower in the summer, and other plants that will flower in the fall. So this table gives a pretty good breakdown of some native plants that folks can plant in their backyard. Uh, this is on a handout that you will see in your worksheet. It's called Conserving Beneficial Insects with Native Plants. Uh, now I'll go into some of the different plants that flower during different parts of the year. So early blooming species include meadow zizia and pinnate coneflower. Those are species that I've been able to see out in the field, both in the prairies but also uh, along roadsides. These are important, plant, flowers like this are important because especially coming out of the winter and especially years like this past year where we've had a winter that just won't quit, um, these are great resources for bees that are coming out of the cold winter and they've eaten up most of their food and they just really need pollen and nectar resources as fast as possible. So those are two species that are important for the early season. Mid-year blooming species like common boneset and swamp milkweed are not only great for bees, but milkweed uh, is great for monarch populations as well. Many of you know that monarchs can only complete their life cycle, lay their eggs on milkweed. So swamp milkweed or even common milkweed are great resources for monarch butterflies as well. 
according to our research, especially out in agricultural land, there's not a lot of flowering species available later in the year for our honeybees and for our native bees. So this is also another important part of the year uh, when bees are looking for better resources. It's also usually the time of year where beekeepers will harvest their honey. And so it's all the more important that bees are able to, usually a beekeeper will leave some honey for their bees, but probably not quite enough to get through the winter. So it's important that uh, those last few flowering plants of the year can play a vital role in a bee being able to put on, um, in a beehive being able to put on more mass by storing more honey for going into the winter. Another resource you'll see on your worksheet is a resource called Gardening for Butterflies and Pollinators. Now this works, this, <clears throat> this handout is more focused on butterflies, but it gives a really great breakdown of different plants um, that folks can plant in their backyard. So they've got flowering plants that include asters, blazing star, clover, which, which honeybees I know love, according to our research and seeing what type of pollen they're collecting, clover's up there, up real high. What I liked about this list was that it also included trees and shrubs. Uh, trees can provide a really great pollen source for bees in the early season, uh, such as the, the maple tree. But there's also a lot of trees that honeybees love, like the basswood or the linden tree, which is native. Um, it, it, honeybees that visit that tree, they create this very kind of clear, delicious tasting honey. Uh, so. I've talked to many beekeepers, many backyard beekeepers, and they say that their linden tree provides them with the best honey. So that would be an example of a, a tree that would benefit pollinators greatly. Um, then elder, th things like elderberry are fantastic because not only are you providing uh, a shrub with floral resources for the bees, but you're also getting a delicious berry out of that. So when we're not just talking about uh, floral reserves for bees. We can also talk about ways that non-honeybees uh, nest and how we can create better habitat for them. There's different ways to build a bee nest, and on your worksheet I've included a handout about this. 30% um, of native bees uh, are wood-dwelling bees, so they, they nest in holes or cavities in wood. And there's a few different ways uh, that you can attract these bees to your yard. The simplest being uh, purchasing a, a block of wood uh, thicker than a two by four and drilling holes in it. Um, you want it to be wood that's not treated. You also want it to be deep enough to go at least six inches, maybe eight inches if you can. Uh, if you're gonna mount it, you wanna put a little uh, uh, overhang on top to make sure that the, that the rain doesn't hit it too hard. But what this will create is just a cavity for a lot of these native species to lay their eggs. You can see in this photo in the bottom right um, what a female native bee will do, a solitary bee will do, is lay an egg, leave some food for it, and then wall it off. And then she'll collect more food and pollen resources, lay another egg, leave food for it, and wall it off. So each tunnel can provide uh, several eggs. Uh, uh, to to grow and hatch in there. It's a good way to attract some of the native wood dwelling species and it's important to remember uh, possibly drill a few different size holes because depending on the species they can sometimes be picky and they want different species will want a different size tunnel to burrow into. Uh, the other photo that you can see on the bottom left we use PVC pipe and and straws different sizes of straw to create a similar type of space for those cavity nesting species. In that PVC pipe, uh, you can attract all sorts of different bees that once again will, will lay their eggs inside um, and hatch in the springtime. And then what's nice about this is that you can trade out the straws after every season so that you've got new clean ones uh, for the bees to start nesting in, in the late summer and fall. 70% of native bees, however, are ground nesting species. So uh, while you can't necessarily build a native nest for ground nesting species, you can be aware of their habitat. So 
Um, they will nest in, they will burrow in mud, they will burrow in uh, the ground in prairie landscapes. Uh, those are the type of areas that they like uh, to, to lay their eggs. So for the ground nesting species, it's important to be aware that uh, you want to leave some open ground for, for bees, preferably around different floral resources and that sort of thing. And I forgot to mention before that many of the wood-dwelling species will uh, nest in logs. So if you have an old stump in your yard, you can place it upright, drill some holes in that as well, and that would be another perfect habitat for some of the uh, wood-nesting species. If you are more interested in beekeeping, um, there are a lot of resources that Iowa State has to offer, including some great e YouTube videos. So if you log into YouTube and you look up the ISU You Know How To videos, there's several beekeeping videos done not by me, uh, but by Dr. Jesse Randall. They're pretty short, they're pretty quick, uh, and they go over some of the basics about purchasing bees. Usually you purchase them in, in January, February, or March. Uh, how to install bees in a hive how to do hive inspections. There's all sorts of things. So I highly suggest if you are interested in learning more about what it means to be a beekeeper, watch those videos. And if you're still interested, uh, go to the Iowa Honey Producers website, uh, the Iowa Honey Producers Association website, and get in contact with the beekeeping group that's in your region. Maybe you can attend some meetings and get some advice and find a mentor to get out there and start producing your own honey in your backyard. These should be on your worksheet, but you can also find these in the Iowa State University Extension Store. These are the titles of different handouts that I've mentioned. So the first one, Conserving Beneficial Insects with Native Plants. The second one, Gardening for Butterflies and Pollinators. And the third one, Build Your Own Solitary Bee Nest. Those are great resources that you can read on your computer or print out and use if you want to. Finally, as I mentioned, a, a huge part of my extension work has to do with developing surveys to measure a Iowan attitudes about uh, conservation programs, uh, about whether or not pollinators are important, about different practices that they're interested in implementing, uh, and about uh, w interest in different programs that are out there that would maybe help them financially um, to create better pollinator habitat. So in your handout, there should be information about how to log in online and take uh, my survey through a website that's called Qualtrics. It's a pretty short survey. When I print it out, it's, it's a one page front and back. I tell people it takes about 60 seconds or less to complete this thing. I ask our three different stakeholders that we've identified. So if you're in this course and you identify yourself as a, a landowner, even if that means that you just have a backyard garden, uh, um, or if you identify as a beekeeper, you're someone who keeps bees here in Iowa, or if you're a farm family, someone who farms and has corn and soybean or, or any other crop, uh, I invite you to log in and take this survey. What this will do for me is two things. One, it will inform my, ex my extension work. So after I've given presentations, this survey will tell me what people are taking away from it, and it will also tell me what people are interested in doing about it. What of these best practices that I've suggested are they interested in actually uh, implementing? The second thing that this will do for me is uh, show the whole university uh, how important the work for pollinators and extension about bees is. Uh, it, it will legitimize uh, the work that I'm doing and hopefully make the university recognize that uh, a full-time extension entomologist providing uh, Iowans with information about bees and about pollinators is something that they want to invest in in the long term. I'm the first of my kind here at Iowa State University. I'm the first extension entomologist focused on bees, and I would like to see this position uh, continue to, to grow and to continue to be an important part of the community for everyone in Iowa. So thank you very much for your time. You can follow me on Instagram, at Iowa State Bees, if you are that type of savvy. I like to put a bunch of different photos that we're taking out in the field, photos of, of our honeybees and photos of native bees that we find, but also what it means to do research in the lab or 
or that sort of thing. So please feel free to do that. If you have any questions, you can email me. My email address is very simple. It's just randall at iastate.edu. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Randall. Now next, we're going to be hearing from Kathleen Dellett about organic gardening. Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Dellett, and I'm a professor in the departments of agronomy and horticulture in the area of organic agriculture. And I'm here today to talk to you about organic gardening. The number one reason why consumers prefer organic foods is to reduce pesticide residue consumption. And that's been shown through various surveys. Now, the easiest way to do that is to grow your own produce and you know exactly what you're putting or spraying or having on your produce. But in addition, if you get fresh produce, it's more nutritious. So knowing the origin of food is extremely important, and you can see from consumers worldwide that that is becoming more and more important to people, to know the origin of their food. And when you buy certified organic, you have assurance that no synthetic products were used. A really good website to look at if you're interested in more about the consumer side of organic gardening and farming is the Organic Trade Association. And in, in that association, they have the Organic Center, which has all the scientific studies about organic agriculture. So I encourage you to check that website out. As you may have noticed that organic is becoming more and more mainstream. Every day somebody will say something to me like my brother yesterday. Did you notice how there's now organic beer advertised on TV? So um, this is just to show how mainstream it's becoming and learning more about it will definitely help you. When you look at what organic foods are consumed, the majority of organic food is in the area of fruits and vegetables, 42%. And today, uh, or I think it was 2017 statistics, 15% of all fruits and vegetables sold in the marketplace are organic. So that's where, those are called the gateway crops. That's where most people begin to consume organic food. There's a lot of statistics here. I'll only talk about a few. For example, that at the last census, we had 5.4 million acres of organic agriculture in the United States, 143 million acres in the world. And if you look just at vegetables, close to 50,000 acres of organic vegetables in 97, and now three times that, that amount in the last census, 2011. The last census, there were 24,650 organic farmers in the United States. And the industry is a $47 billion industry um, in the U.S. and $90 billion in global sales. The annual growth rate, rate for organic products is, was 8.8% in 2016. And Iowa has the sixth largest number of organic farmers in the U.S. This map here on the right will show you which states, the darker the state, the more organic production. So Iowa is one of the darker states, not quite as much production as the east and west coast, west coast having the most organic production, but uh, we have the sixth largest number of organic farmers. And then when you look at sales, Iowa is the, has the 10th largest amount of organic sales in the U.S., $103 million, and this was in 2014, the last time they did this. But that's pretty good when you see we're up there with the heavy hitters like California and Washington, Oregon, Pennsylvania. So just to show how important organic is in Iowa. Now, what about if you want to grow organic foods? And even if you just grow them for your, in your backyard, someday you may want to expand and take them to the local marketplace or even become a full-time marketer for organic produce. Well, these days, consumers expect organic foods to have high quality. They know that they're buying them because they're considered healthier products produced in an ecologically sound manner. And because of that extra effort you put into growing those vegetables, they're willing to pay price premiums. Many organic consumers select organic products based on the fact that they're locally produced, they're fresh, and they're raised by farm families. So you can add those labels, too, to your product. Now, you've seen products called natural, and there's other eco-labels. They're great, they're fine, but they're not regulated by the law. So USDA regulates the word organic. You can't use the word organic unless you follow USDA rules. 
I mentioned about pesticides being the number one reason why people prefer avoiding pesticides is the number one reason why people prefer organic products. And there's been various studies. It's just one at the University of Washington where they looked at pesticide metabolites in children that were fed organic and conventional food. And they found that those concentrations of pesticide metabolites were six times lower when children were fed organic food over conventional produce. What about nutritional compa comparisons? Well, the Organic Trade Center um, has all, a lot of scientific studies on their website, so I encourage you to look at the details on that. The graph up here shows where's X, that uh, crop, for example, tomatoes, that had higher, higher nutrient content. E is equivalent. So sweet corn, they found equivalent uh, vitamin C and vitamin E, but all the other X's you see up there is they actually found higher nutrient content in the organic product. And then additionally, in the British Journal of Nutrition, um, it was reported that organic meat and milk were 50% higher in omega-3 fatty acids, which are beneficial fatty acids, and 40% higher in conjugated linoleic acid, which is another beneficial fatty acid, than um, the conventional equivalents. So you can see the benefits there of eating organic foods. And around the country, the chefs are leading the way in promoting organic foods. There's three groups, the Chefs Collaborative, Slow Foods, Convivia, and restaurants and food services are also nowadays promoting more organic foods. These are uh, pictures of Kurt Fries at Devote Restaurant in Iowa City. He's a member of the Slow Foods Convivium and puts local and organic food on his menu. And Lynn Rosetta Casper from the Splendid Table with um, National Public Radio, who um, came to Iowa and created an Iowa organic pizza using Iowa organic um, ingredients. So in addition to those other benefits, um, the Agronomy, Agronomy for Sustainable Development Journal published in 2015 that, and they did this meta-analysis of organic farms. They found that the organic farms had 30 to 50 percent higher soil micro, microorganisms compared to conventional farms. In the macrofauna, they found that an increase of 100 to 2,500 percent, and beneficial nematodes, 100 to 700 percent increase on organic farms. So what exactly is organic? According to the USDA, the National Organic Program, the, their definition is an, that organic is an ecological production management system that promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles, and soil biological activity. It's based on minimum use of off-farm inputs and management practices that restore, maintain, and enhance ecological harmony. So those, that's the positive side. Some people say the rules are the negative side, but they're actually very good to have in place. It's uh, the reason that you can be called certified organic, and that is that you have to have three years between the last application of a prohibited substance, in this case, synthetic fertilizers and, pe and pesticides, and the harvest of your certified organic crops. So if you happen to, for example, use Roundup herbicide last year, 2017, you would not be able to be certified until 2020. And then no genetically modified organisms are allowed in organic production or processing. So what do you use instead of chemicals? You're using naturally raised products, and we'll go over some of those. And it's management intensive. So you're going to be out there routinely observing your plant health and weeds, Here's a picture monitoring for cabbage butterfly larvae. And as we mentioned, no synthetic fertilizers or pesticides, including urea or Roundup. Some people have thought that those were based on natural products, but in fact, they are based, they have their petroleum base. So no petroleum based products are allowed in organic. So what are you doing for fertilization? You're relying on the farm's own internal processes for fer fertility and pest management. So you're practicing crop, ro crop rotations. Um, as a matter of fact, you're not allowed to grow the same crop in the same place every year. That's what's required for certified organic. So in general, you're going to have a minimum of three crops. For vegetable farmers or gardeners, this is not a big deal. Usually, I'd say the average is about 25 crops on a typical vegetable farm. So um, having those crops in rotation is a good thing to do. For your 
nitrogen fertilization, you're going to be using compost, manure, and cover crops. And there is a restriction in organic that your raw manure has to be put on at least 120 days before the harvest of the vegetable. And if you have agronomic crops like corn and soybeans, it has to be put on 90 days for agronomic crops. And this uh, relates to food safety issues. So in general, you're using products that are found in nature. Um, they are also listed in the National Organic Program National List, which is on the web. So if you want to find specifically uh, a certain product you want to use, you can look on that National Organic Program list. Uh, we've used various composts in our research uh, made from chicken manure basis, or um, the best one we found was this hoop house swine manure. If you know anybody that's uh, raising hogs in what they call hoop houses there, that uh, manure and straw that is made is created through that production system provides excellent fer fertilization for organic gardens. So testing your soil is really critical. We generally test in the fall after the crop and then base our recommendations on that if we need to add any amendments in addition to the compost. In general, we're just adding compost, but um, certain years you may find you have a low phosphorus content, for example, and you could add rock phosphate. I'll talk about that in a minute. Having the correct variety and cultivar is critical to have a successful organic garden, so you want to pick the most insect and disease resistant or tolerant varieties. So when you look through the catalog, make sure you're checking for varieties that say they have, for example, verticillium, fusarium, nematode resistance. So you can start out with the strongest plant possible. And then management of weeds, insects, and diseases is critical for successful organic production. And crop rotations will really help with that. And also um, using approved treatments. So here's an example, I'll talk about more later, but of squash with KO and clay. You can see the leaves are white from the clay product we sprayed on there, and that helps protect against squash bugs. Site selection is critically important for your organic garden. If you can create raised beds, they will give you a little boost because you'll get that increased drainage on the raised beds. If you can't afford to do that, it's okay as long as they're not um, sitting in a wet spot on your in your yard. Um, soil type, loamy is best. Something that drains very freely is best. If you have a heavy clay soil, you want, might want to amend it with compost so that it could drain easier. Having in your site in full sun is really critical. Don't plant around trees, under trees. Uh, you might have some headaches there. Irrigation, uh, with global climate change, irrigation is now required for organic gardens in Iowa. Uh, when I first came here in the late 90s, you could easily get through a whole season without any irrigation because we had rains on a regular basis. But in the, over the last five to seven years, the rains have been so erratic, it would have been impossible to produce a good vegetable crop without irrigation. And there's different forms of irrigation, anything from the plain old sprinkler to a drip irrigation. Drip is the best. If you can do it, it will save you money and save energy. A lot of folks are putting in these high tunnels now, plastic greenhouses that can be movable or they're set in place. And the USDA, NRCS, Natural Resource Conservation Service, does provide cost share for them. So if you're an avid gardener, you might want to look into getting a high tunnel on your, at your place. Uh, it's a wonderful way to extend your season. For example, right now, some people are actually seeing flowers on tomatoes that they planted as early as March in their high tunnels. And you can have them with or without supplemental heating, but I'm pretty sure NRCS does not allow heating if you're going to get cost share from them. So why crop rotations? Basically, they help improve soil structure and fertility. They're going to add organic matter. And in the case of a legume, it will fix nitrogen in your soil, so you'll get that ben benefit of having extra nitrogen from your leguminous cover crops, such as what's shown here, uh, red clover in this picture. And then we say every five years a cover crop is required. If you're doing intensive vegetable production, specifically for commercial vegetable production, you would need to put in a cover crop to help build your soil. 
But at home, it's not bad to put one in, too. Um, we generally put in rye and white clover at our home garden. And that will help interrupt insect, weed, and disease cycles because when you change the plant, the host plant, the uh, pests have a more difficult time trying to find that crop that they're looking for. So you confuse them by changing the crops. And as I mentioned, the, the rule in certified organic is the same crop cannot be grown in the same area every year. And also having a rotation really helps with disease, specifically solanaceous crops, so potatoes, eggplants. It's really important to rotate out of them to avoid disease at least three years, I would say, between solanaceous crops. So the in crop rotation, general rule of thumb is you're building your soil through a cover crop, and then you're going to take advantage of that additional nitrogen and carbon that you've built, this in, built into the soil through the cover crop and have your heaviest nitrogen feeder, for example, sweet corn, being your first crop in the rotation. Then the next year you might want to go to your medium nitrogen feeder in that same spot, and that could be tomato or pepper, and then end up in the third year with your lowest nitrogen feeder, and those are crucifers like broccoli, potatoes, and onion. Then you can build your soil again. Now some gardeners, farmers I know, actually add a cover crop after each crop and each cycle. And of course they have some of the best soil around. So how do you make compost? You can use leaves, grass, garden and kitchen waste. We just collect our kitchen scraps and put them into our compost barrel every night or every other night. Uh, really helps build that nitrogen source in your compost. Cover crops we mentioned, and it's always good to have a mixture of a legume and a grass uh, as opposed to just a legume by itself. Fish emulsion and seaweed are allowed in organic. Again, check the labels just to make sure there's no, no uh, prohibited products, but in general, uh, they are, they're all pretty much available for organic gardens. There's also plant-based based fertility mixtures like alfalfa meal, soybean meal. With those, you just have to make sure they're not GMO, alfalfa, GMO, soybean. I'm not sure they are, have been made into a meal for a fertilizer, but it's always worth checking. So compost is definitely, um, I'd say, the heart of organic fertility for vegetable gardens. And it's, they're really, compost is great to make and it's great to use. It uh, recycles nutrients, so that's a tenant of ecologically based farming. You have a slow release of nutrients. Your microbial populations will be increased by using compost. And it also assists in moisture retention in the soils. Hopefully you get your pile hot enough that you're destroying weed seeds and pathogens. And then it helps reduce the odor of the original feedstock. So if you make a manure-based pile, by the time it's done, it should not smell anything like manure. It should smell just like fresh soil. So here's a picture of um, coffee waste vermiculture compost. This was in Costa Rica when I visited there at an organic farm. And so they raised coffee and all the refuse from the coffee processing was used to create a wonderful compost. And it was called vermiculture because the worms actually lived on the refuse. And um, you can either sell the compost with the worms in it, or you can sh um, shake the compost through a screen to get the worms out before you would sell and use the compost. Either way is fine. So in addition to using leaves, chip branches, grass, kitchen waste, crop residues, you can also use hay and straw. Some folks add lime to, if the pH is too acidic in their compost, they'll put limestone in there. Uh, you can use sulfur, rock phosphate, and clay. Those are more special ingredients, I would say, and, and I would not use them typically unless your pH was off. Um, there's also a form of organic farming called biodynamic. And that um, is really complex. And they use special preparations that consist of microbes and kelp. And it's um, that would be a whole other lecture. But if you're interested in that, just Google it. And there are biodynamic farms around Iowa that you could visit and learn about that way of organic farming. Commercial composts are available. You can purchase those. Uh, when we farmed organically in California, that was the only way we could get compost. 
was buying a commercial land. It was very expensive, so it's really nice here in Iowa how you have access to all the ingredients to make wonderful compost here for very cheap. And so for manure, we've used cattle manure, poultry manure, and swine manure. Um, on the coast, they tend to use composts that, are, that have feather meal in them. That generally comes from, as you can imagine, the poultry industry. There's more poultry on the coast. We've done a lot of research in our lab looking at the soil quality in organic systems versus conventional. And Dr. Cindy Kimberdell with USDA, this is some of her um, data showing that over the 19 years that she's studied the organic system, the soil quality has been consistently higher compared to the conventional rotations. And she attributes this to the compost we use and the long crop rotations. So in the conventional side, you're only um, having corn and soybeans in that rotation. While in the organic, you have corn, soybean, oats, and alfalfa. So the oats and alfalfa add a lot of organic matter to the system. So the soil organic carbon has always been higher in the organic system. But all these uh, parameters that are outlined in black, they, they are significantly greater than their conventional counterparts. For inorganic nitrogen, you don't want it to be higher than the conventional, cause, because this is what you want to mitigate. You don't want a lot of inorganic nitrogen in your soil that could lead to runoff and pollution. Okay, what about weeds? In your organic garden, you will be managing your weeds through cover crops and crop rotation, and there's also tools. Um, backpack flamers, shown here, just the wand of it, but you can see the it's run on um, propane gas. And then in the com commercial fields, they'll use this mechanical flamer cultivator, or mechanical flamer, and then they can cultivate behind it. These, this runs on propane too. So you just, you know, have to be a little cautious with it. You're not actually, you're never lighting the field on fire. You're not burning the plants. You're just boiling the water in the cells of the weeds, and that causes them to wilt. So um, it's an interesting process. If you're a pyromaniac like me, it's really fun to watch the weeds wilt when you bring the flame out there, but um, you do have to use caution. And then the main way in a garden is going to be through cultivation, using your hose, hand hose, and rototiller. Um, and I know even up to five ac a five-acre organic farm that is, just uses those two tools to manage their weeds. They also plant cover crops, too. Um, this is an example of a cover crop in Hawaii where they planted this uh, desmodium cover crop and then they had weeder geese go in there and keep the cover crop mowed to a good height and it was a perfect system. Virtually no weeds in that um, organic coffee orchard. But mulches in general are the workhorses for organic weed management. So you can use oat or wheat straw. Um, I prefer using wheat. It just seems like it doesn't the, sweet, the seeds in it don't germinate as much as oat straw. You can also use wool. I had a student that worked on a wool mulch here. Uh, flax is another um, type of mulch. And then good old plastic mulch. Now, the problem with plastic is it does create landfill problems. And the requirement in organic is that it has to be pulled at the end of every season and disposed. So you can't burn it. You can't bury it. You have to pull it out of the field, and you have to um, take it to the landfill. So that's an extra burden um, why I don't like plastic. Um, wood chips are good for perennial crops. This is uh, shown. This is our grape, a grapevine that's wrapped with plastic to prevent predators, and it's uh, mulched with wood chips. Papers also, I've seen that used in um, commercial orchards, and... Um, it's good, but you have to make sure you're using lead-free paper. And this is regular cover crops that are either terminated through rolling crimping, which I'll show you in a minute, or um, planting a winter-killed cover crop, which dies naturally. So this is organic no-till, and you're making your own crushed cover crop mulch. This is how we do it commercially, where you plant the cover crop in the fall, in this case rye, and then you come in in the spring and crush it with this roller and plant right behind it. And as it dies, it makes a really good mulch that prevents weeds. 
And then I've seen pictures on the web where you can make your own just using a piece of board and crushing the cover crop that way. Or you can make a little um, smaller roller crimper to pull through your garden. Uh, we received our roller crimper from Rodale Institute, and um, it's been a real champion. We're still using it today. This is some of our research using that roller crimper, where this plot, side of the plot here was uh, the cover crop was crushed with the roller crimper, and this is where we just use regular tillage equipment um, to control. Now, right, right in this shot, they look like they're a lot bigger, the tilled, where the weeds were tilled compared to the mulch. But in the end, they caught up. These caught up. The no-till caught up. They just take a little longer to produce because it's, the soil's a little cooler in the beginning. What about diseases in your organic garden? Well, again, the first thing to do is look for resistant or tolerant cultivars um, in your seed catalogs. And then pruning and spacing really helps to promote airflow. Um, to an air, air is an enemy of disease. Keeping that airflow going can help prevent spores from um, taking hold and causing disease. And then removing diseased leaves and plants is also a way to go. Compost applications, there's some research with that using compost tea. You can Google that and uh, use make your compost into a um, solution and spray that on your plants. Um, I had a farmer who did some research with a copper wire through tomato stems that help prevent disease. Basically, you're adding copper into the plant system. It's the same as spraying a plant with copper. And also there's uh, hydrogen peroxide and baking soda that are available. Um, again, you need to make sure you're following the regulations on those. So read up on those before you would use those for disease management. And finally, as always, crop rotation helps with disease too. Insects. Haven't really had a big problem with insect management in our organic grain crops. Organic vegetable crops, you will occasionally run into some insect pests. It's really important to prevent pests by cleaning up after harvest. And you can use these row covers in, during the season to help prevent pests by pulling them up, putting them over the plant during the season. That helps keep the um, insects out. Now, some plants require, some crops require that you remove them at flowering. And in the case of squash, for example, so you want, because you want to let the pollinators in there, and then you'd have to put them back on, um, which is more of a hassle. You can also put the bee boxes at the end of the rows. I'll show you that in a minute. So you wouldn't have to take them off at flowering. Companion planting has been used a lot, like marigolds for nematodes, although fortunately we don't have a big problem with nematodes. Uh, harmful nematodes here in Iowa, but in uh, Florida, for example, marigolds are used extensively, uh, planted with vegetables to help prevent nematode problems. And again, crop rotation. Um, knowing your pests, their life history, their natural enemies, their relationship with climatic conditions is really important. When do flea beetles come in? They they really like dry weather, so um, keeping keeping it moist out there, spraying the leaves occasionally will help, but um, if you get them, then you need to know when to manage them and probably manage them at the first chance you see them would be really critical. Larvae, big fat larvae, um, like this tomato hornworm, you can just hand pick them um, if it's a garden situation. We actually do it in our commercial scale too. Uh, spend a day out there hand picking them and dropping them into a soap, a can with soap and water in it. Um, you can use an organic spray for these worms, Lepidoptera larvae, but um, I'll talk about that in a minute. It's really critical, as I mentioned, to get out there, do a lot of scouting, and harvest those vegetables the minute they're ready. Um, harvest early and often will really make a difference and destroy all infested fruits and vegetables. You don't want that source material to stay out there. Just a little bit more on floating row covers. I really love these things. Um, shown here. You just lay them over. Now, if you have a windy situation, you're going to have to put rebar on the sides to tack them down or stones or whatever you have. And then, so then you can either remove them a few hours during flowering to allow pollination, or you can have those bee boxes. And then that's why I was saying, know your life cycle of your insect pests, because after they're finished their egg laying cycle, then you can remove these 
uh, row covers for the rest of the season. There are also pheromone traps and ties that are allowed in organic, and they, in general, can be used for monitoring insects, insect flights, but they can also trap them. If you have yellow sticky traps that are imbued with a pheromone, they can also be used for trapping. They, in orchards, they're used to confuse the males and interrupt mating, which tends to lower the pest populations overall. So they're used extensively for codling moth, um, I've seen a few for squash borer and plum cuculeo, too. So biocontrol is the basis of sound organic farming. Just about every pest has a natural enemy. That's a predator, like a lady beetle. A parasite, shown here, are these um, parasitic wasp cocoons. And the larvae, that's a beneficial um, parasitic wasp larvae there. Uh, then, and then there's also entomopathogens that exist for nearly every pest. Lacewing is a predator that eats a lot of uh, harmful insect eggs, for example. You can buy um, beneficial insects, that's called augmentation, but in general they only work in enclosed conditions like greenhouses. So outside, conservation is much more effective. So how do you conserve those beneficial insects? Well, they need a source of food, and they need both the prey, which is the harmful insect, but they also need, the adults need pollen and nectar. So always having a diversity in your farm landscape or your garden landscape is important. Plants that are particularly beneficial in feeding um, beneficial insects are buckwheat, clovers, and herbs like dill, mint, yarrow, etc. So you can use um, organic insecticides, organic approved insecticides, but even with those, you should limit them to emergencies because they may, in certain cases, affect beneficial insects. Um, nothing to the extent of a synthetic pesticide, but they could possibly have an effect on them. So some of the insectary plants, they're also called insectary plants. We've used our alyssum, sweet alyssum you can see here. In California, all the organic orchards have bell beans planted in their middles, and they really help uh, attract and feed beneficial parasitic wasps. Um, there's also, this is an organic orchard in Colorado that had a lot of yarrow and mint planted in his uh, middles of his tree orchard. So I mentioned there are organic insecticides. Um, again, they have to be naturally based. Check with your certification agency if you're going certified organic because you don't want to get thrown out if you accidentally use something that had a prohibited product in it. Um, again, using them as a last resort. Example of one that's used a lot is BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, not BT corn, not GMO corn or anything that's been genetically modified to have BT in it. This is the natural bacteria that you find. It's actually a soil bacteria. There's also um, botanical insecticides like pyrethrum, sabadilla, and neem. We've used neem a lot. Sometimes we use pyrethrum, uh, for example, for insects like flea beetles. There's also natural treatments like diatomaceous earth, garlic, hot pepper, vegetable oils, and soaps that you can use. So I'll just walk you through some crops that we've grown commercially and um, tell you how we did it. So starting with organic sweet corn. We rotate crops and we plant the corn after a cover crop or a legume, for example, a crop of beans, then we could follow it with sweet corn. We apply compost to about 120 pounds of nitrogen per acre. That's about the maximum we would go, um, supplying 120 pounds of nitrogen. We'll use a resistant or tolerant variety. The tighter the husk, the easier it is to grow organically because it makes it more difficult for the corn earworm to get in there um, into the ear of the corn. So that you can see right here, it's a pretty tight husk. That's what you want in organic. We will still apply Dipel. That's a commercial uh, name of a product that has Bt bacillus thuringiensis in it at silking when the corn first begins to silk and three days later. And that really helps give you a really clean ear like this one shown here. I do add some post-harvest tips because it's one thing to grow them organically, but you want to keep that delicious 
perfect condition post-harvest too. So to cool down your ears as soon as possible, commercially they do it with hydrocooling where they'll stick the ears right into this tank of cold water. If you can do that, that's the best. That'll really preserve the flavor. But get them into the refrigerator as soon as possible if you can't do that. And in the experiments, we've shown that adding, um, spraying with BT brings the earworm population down, the earworm damage down, and then adding some soybean oil, for example, can lower the damage even further. And then I mentioned about the different tolerant varieties, like this one called Lush, as you can see it a lot more, had a much more open husk, so higher ear earworm damage compared to Ambrosia and Merlin's. Now, some um, organic farmers release a beneficial wasp called Trichogramma, Ostrina, and that um, parasitizes, will attack and parasitize the corn earworm. Um, I haven't tried it. I would like to try it. Um, you, you might think that rate is huge, 30,000 wasps per acre, but they're very tiny, so you, you could barely see them if, when you release them. Okay, what about organic squash? That's been another one of our signature organic crops. But I make it easy on myself. I only grow winter squash with that hard, thick skin. That really makes a difference. Summer squash is a little more difficult to grow. Um, gets a little more pests than the hard winter squash. We actually did a project for Gerber baby food um, so they could amp up their supply of this uh, butternut squash and corn baby food. And um, they were really happy with the results because we had a bumper crop when we did it. So I mentioned about winter squash more tolerant, and but we do use co row covers to avoid squash bug and cucumber beetle. And then we also, um, once we took the covers off, if we thought we still saw enough of the beetles, we would spray with surround clay. We also did an experiment where we compared surround to row covers, and surround by itself did a pretty good job. Then post-harvest, Cure, you cure the squash in the field. So even when it's mature, you let it stay out in the field and harden off and then store it dry in the barn and never, ever let water get on them. So use a cloth versus um, water for cleaning any dirt on your squash. And here's one of those bee boxes that you can buy. They're bumblebees and um, you can connect them to the ends of your row covers. And I've seen a commercial organic farm use those in Iowa, and they're very happy with them. You can also provide nesting boxes for the native bees here. We have many species of native bees. For example, the blue mason bee here. They'll help with pollination in your, on your, in your garden or farm. One thing I'm not sure everybody's aware of is that you know, the, the squash plant produces a lot of flowers, and particularly male flowers um, that don't make fruit. So you can sell those excess male blossoms at the farmer's market. They're very popular in a lot of countries where they're dipped into a batter mix and then fried, and they kind of taste like mushrooms. They're really good. So cucumber beetles uh, can be a nemesis if you have a lot of those around. Rotation will really help to move the cucurbit crop as far away as you can um, every year from the last crop because the beetles overwinter in Iowa. And then mulching with straw or hay will help because they don't like walking across that. Trellis, if possible, will really help too in all cucumber or cucurbit crops. Um, then you can use the row covers early in the season and surround later. The worst thing about these is that they transmit bacterial wilt. So if you go out there someday and you see your cucurbit uh, plant looking like that, particularly zucchini, I think it's this moss smell in here. Um, it's, there's not much you can do. You'd have to remove the portion of the plant that's damaged. And so um, that, the pathogen spreads from plant to plant through the beetle feeding. You can tell if you have it, if you take your um, stems and break them apart, and if you see that stringy mycelia between the two ends of the stem, that's the bacterial wilt. So, um, you know, we mentioned row covers. There's some tolerant cucumber varieties, muskmelon, no resistance that I know of, and um, other cucurbits like the hard squash are less susceptible. And remove those, they call them symptomatic plants. If you see a plant like that, get it out of there so that it won't provide a source for the transmission. Squash bugs can be another um, 
hard pest to deal with sometimes in an organic garden or farm. We leave out pans of water for this parasitic fly. He actually, he, she actually will come and drink water from this pan, and they parasitize the uh, squash bug. They'll a lay their eggs right on top of the squash bug. Um, sometimes you can see little white bu um, eggs sticking out on top of the squash bug. But again, row covers surround, and you can put boards out in your garden and then hand pick the uh, squash bugs that go underneath those boards. If you have chickens too, they like those. Um, squash vine borer management, again, tolerant varieties, row covers. Some people plant a trap crop, an early trap crop of zucchini or Hubbard squash, for example, and then destroy that when it's infested to save the main crop. Um, that you can also trap them with pheromone traps. You can use an exacto knife to actually open up your uh, squash um, base and dig out the larvae, and then you can close it back up and wrap it with uh, grafting wax or um, I've seen people just tie rubber bands around it, and it, believe it or not, it will grow back together. But that's a very labor-intensive way to go. Um, I've tried spraying at the, with Bacillus dipel at the first sign of the moths and repeat at weekly intervals, and that seemed to help. And then keeping the kale and clay on there can help repel them, too. Here's a picture of the adult um, squash vine borer and the pheromone trap, and you can see some are in there, so you can use those to trap the squash vine board too. As I mentioned, we did some experiments with um, floating row covers versus uh, the clay alone. And we also compared it to a buckwheat intercrop to see if that would mask the squash and confuse the insects and therefore lead to lower um, insect populations. Well, it might have done that. <laughs> I don't have the insect data. But the, the buckwheat was so competitive with the squash, it had the lowest yield, um, even compared to the control. So if you plant at the same time, it's going to be too competitive. Some people said you can go in later after the squash is flowering and plant the buckwheat, and that could help. So you could try that too. But we definitely showed an impact with the surround. So when we didn't spray anything, 10.2 squash bugs per plant compared to 2 to 3 when we spray this around. So the kale and clay definitely will reduce the squash bugs in the absence of road covers. Okay, organic tomatoes. Again, rotate your crop. We'll follow the um, corn or the cover crop with a tomato crop. And compost, don't apply it too excessively. 80 to 100 pounds per acre uh, is, and it should say nitrogen, 80 to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre from your compost. Using resistant varieties, again, look in the catalog, make sure you see all those resistance um, attributes. Trellising and pruning plants to increase airflow, harvesting early and often. And then, um, as I mentioned, there's been some experiments with hydrogen peroxide or another biological called Serenade that is actually a bacteria called Bacillus subtilis for disease suppression. Uh, I haven't done any research on that, so I can't tell you specifically um, what the application rate would be. Now, heirloom tomatoes are a big hit these days. They are delicious. They have more flavor, but they're a little more management intensive. They don't have as much disease resistance in them. So if as much as possible, use drip irrigation on them because you want to keep their leaf surface dry. Just a couple slides on fruit. I know this is specifically mentioning vegetable production, but um, usually farmers, gardeners have some fruit trees around too. We've done a lot of research on organic apples. And again, the best thing is start with scab-resistant cultivars. Like John Free, Red Free, Enterprise, there's probably 20 scab-resistant cultivars you can grow in Iowa. It just makes your life so much easier because you don't have to worry about this disease called scab that will require a lot of spraying if you want to grow it organically. And then codling moth and plum curculio can be managed with surround mating disruption, those pheromone ties I was talking about. There's also a biological virus that attacks um, codling moth. It's called codling moth granulosis virus, commercial name Cidex. Um, and trust is a spinosad fungus, and that can be used against 
um, pests in the apple orchard too. So if you want to learn more about that, we have a publication on organic apple production in Iowa. Uh, grape research, we've done some grape research out at the Neely Canyon Farm. And um, we use straw and cover crops in the middles of the vineyard. We use disease and cold tolerant cultivars. Some of those are shown here, Marisol Foch, Edelweiss, La Crosse, St. Croix, and Norton. Pruning is really important to help keep disease down, to do it in the early spring, and then in July again to open up that canopy. We do spray with lime sulfur against anthracnose disease, and we've occasionally used copper uh, for black rot and downy mildew. However, um, copper is a restricted fungicide in organics, so you need to make sure you record everything and your inspector, when they come out for their organic inspector, they will ask about your records specifically for copper um, because it's restricted in the number of times you can use it. Leaf hoppers have not been a big problem. They're a big problem in um, vineyards in California where I used to work. And the way they managed them is they would plant these insectary plants as, as this is here, the red clover, to attract beneficial insects and help keep the populations down. Um, there's also, occasionally you'll find this grape forester caterpillar, and we'll use BT Dipel to spray for that. We did some research where we um, help prevent weeds, maintain um, good weed management by putting wood chips as the layer base layer and then occasionally if we needed if uh, if weeds came through the mulch layer we would spray with uh, vinegar um, herbicide that was allowed in organic um, to help control compared to this is a typical ground cover in a in a vineyard so that's a picture of some of our grapes at the Neely Canyon farm and my favorite grape bluebell which can be used for both fresh eating and for juice and jam. So just summing up here, I know um, the focus is on gardening. However, as I mentioned, I've known a lot of folks that started out gardening and then they ended up selling their excess to different markets. So if you're interested in marketing, I encourage you to do it. It's a good way to recoup some funds that you've used for your garden, especially if you expand your garden. And it, it will require some effort. It's not like you can just walk into a store and say, I have some produce to sell. You need to meet with the produce manager and bring a sample of your uh, produce and basically set up a schedule for when you're going to be delivering. More and more grocers are accepting local foods, like Whole Foods, natural grocers in Des Moines. Um, they'll now take local produce. There's health food stores have always taken local produce, Wheatsfield Co-op in Ames, New Pioneer Co-op in Iowa City. If you're selling as organic, they're going to require that you are certified organic and you're going to have to show your certificate. Other institutions that are interested in local produce are food service, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, ISU Dining, for example, now is um, taking some local and organic and sustainably grown produce. But in around Waterloo, for example, there's been a big movement to get local foods into hospitals, nursing homes, and schools. So you can um, Google that and sit, learn about their food hubs there. And then restaurants. Um, locally here in Ames, the cafe and Plus 39 are interested in getting local organic produce. So I mentioned about meeting with the buyers. Uh, take a sample, colorful, clean variety of produce. Make sure you have cleaned everything before you take it to them. Plant in succession to meet the market demands. Develop a schedule to meet volume demands. And then set your prices based on your cost of production and what local sellers are obtaining. So that's going to take some record keeping, but it's, it's very good to take keep records of your garden and especially your farm uh, if you step up your production. And uh, make sure you're you know, recouping your costs. So um, that definitely takes some juggling. There are uh, a lot of web web pages um, at Iowa State about setting your cost of production through the Ag Decision Maker website, it's called. You can um, learn how to set your prices and uh, determine your cost of production by going to that website. And remember that certified organic produce will garner higher prices. So it's generally worth it to pay for that extra 
cost of certification because you can charge higher prices for your produce. Now, on the retail level, there's CSAs, Community Support Agriculture Schemes, where consumers purchase shares, usually in the neighborhood of $300, $600 a season, for a box of food that comes to you each week of the season. And you can pick up on the farm or some people deliver, um, have delivery points around town. When I first came to Ames, I actually had home delivery uh, from a CSA. It was wonderful, but that doesn't happen anymore. Um, we have a large number of farmers markets. You can, if you're interested in selling to farmers markets, it's really um, a big uh, retail market in Iowa. We have second in the nation in the number of farmers markets per capita, and the fourth number per nationally. So Iowa as a whole has a large number of farmers markets. Now they will require a certificate if you're claiming your produce is organic. And the trade-offs with farmers markets is you have it's a lot of time on your feet, and those that have greater people skills will have higher sales. So if you're not a people person, you might want to keep it to the wholesale markets. Um, then they have their requirements for shade tents, coolers, and in general, they don't like you reselling other people's produce. Then there's direct to consumers, selling on your farm, or direct delivery to your consumers. I love farmer's markets. I take pictures of them around the country. This is some from California and some from Iowa, too. Just to send out a shout-out about our conference. Every year we have an organic conference at the University of Iowa in their Memorial Union. Our, this year it's November 18th and 19th, and we really emphasize tasting regional organic produce. And we usually have a couple of classes on organic fruit and vegetable production. And the best part is the chef there will take everything we bring him, all local and organic produce, meat, uh, dairy products, and turn it into this fabulous meal, which is the highlight of the conference for me. We have a lot of research projects going on, too, across the state. So if you're ever interested in any of our research results, they are on our website, our organic ag website at Iowa State. And please contact us if you need any more information. We also have a field day once a year in Adair County at the largest uh, certified organic research site there in um, Greenfield. And um, we also sponsor some workshops throughout the year too. So keep track on our webpage where we post all this information. And then sometimes we put things in the national press too. The New Farm Magazine just did a story about our organic program here at Iowa State. And um, there's also the Organic Ag Info website, and ATRA um, is another website that has a lot of organic information. We, finally, we do have extension publications on organics. Uh, this is just a few of them. As I mentioned, we have that Apple one. We also have one on building compost, how to build compost, and cover crops, and a few more organic vegetable production. So there's a few more than the ones shown here and our webpage. So if you go to Iowa State's webpage and just Google organic, it will take you to our organic webpage. On there we have our calendar, tells you all the events going on. All our research publications, our reports are posted there. And then we have resources which can tell you about where to buy seeds and get these uh, treatments so I was talking about, organic uh, pest management treatments, for example, organic fertilizers, that'll all be listed on the resources. Regulations, if you're interested in becoming certified organic, go there. And then other groups that are working with organic are also listed on our webpage. So finally, there's my contact information. If you want to get in touch with us, ask us any questions about organic ag, just um, go to send me an email or phone call or uh, go to the website and see what's there. So in conclusion, uh, the most apparent benefit that has been derived through scientific research um, has shown that organic produce has lower pesticide residues. And organic has also been shown to have higher um, soluble solids and higher antioxidants and lower nitrates. The consumers will continue to purchase organic foods because of the way the food is produced Consumers are interested in supporting farmers that protect the environment and support family farms. So this shows that there's great opportunities for organic marketers.
So if you are just growing for your home or for your neighbors, I encourage you to look into expanding your production if you really like growing organically. Thank you very much, and please contact me for any further information.